Äh, wer von Ihnen hat so ein Telefon? Also das sage ich nicht, damit Sie das jetzt ausstellen, das sowieso. Sondern ich habe, das hat keinen Zweck, etwas zu Werner Sobeck zu sagen. Denn wenn Sie so ein Telefon haben, dann haben Sie auch Wikipedia. Und da sind Sie schon 20 Minuten am Lesen. Und da ist wirklich viel, viel drin. Ich bin ja schon alt gewesen. Ja, nee, nee, der ist eben noch nicht so alt, aber er ist alt genug, um an der Hochschule erstmal aufzuhören, aber nicht etwa, weil er damit aufhört, sondern weil er weiterhin unbeirrbar in die Zukunft denkt. Und er ist eigentlich das, was zu ganz alten Zeiten mal der Baumeister war, nämlich alles, Ingenieur und Architekt. Und eben weit darüber hinaus geht, gehend eben alles auch umfasst. Denn die Welt war damals noch leichter umfassbar als heute. Nicht? Und er füllt auch als Person das, was man die kulturelle Lücke nennt. Sie wissen ja, dass die gesamte gesellschaftliche Entwicklung eigentlich getrieben ist durch die, wir nennen das Technik, also durch die Produktionsweise, die sich seit der Steinzeit Schritt für Schritt entwickelt hat. Und Sie wissen, dass die Kultur dem verinnerlichten, verinnerlichend und deutend nachfolgt. Und diesen Zeitraum nennt man die kulturelle Lücke. Und der Mensch, der ist ständig dabei, dieses Spagat über die kulturelle Lücke zu machen. Denn normalerweise sind Architekten, das Bauen ist ja eine langsame Kunst, nicht wahr? Die sind eine halbe, eine Generation häufig hinter der Entwicklung hinterher. Auch manchmal bei den Geisteswissenschaften. Und die überbrücken dann die Lücke und haben natürlich immer Schwierigkeiten, dem zu folgen. So ist das auch mit der kulturellen Lücke zum Beispiel, ich würde mal sagen, wenigstens seit dem Club of Rome. Denn bis man aufwachte, hat es, das glaube ich, ja zwei, zwei Generationen her, so, und äh, diese Lücke muss man überwinden. Und äh, darum finde ich das so großartig, dass er das kommt. So, ich habe mich ja schon bei ihm bedankt, aber ich muss das noch einmal sagen. Dafür zu uns zu kommen und dann adressiert an die nächste Generation und das nach einem Leben genau in dem Bemühen, diese kulturelle Lücke, nämlich dieses Gap zwischen dem, was man baut, Kunst nennt und Technik zu, zu überbrücken und dabei aufzupassen, dass man da also nicht zum Sektierer wird. Ja, nicht? Oder zum, ja, ja, klar, die Revolution, die hauen ja erstmal alles kaputt, da muss man wieder Heile machen. Nicht? So, und das finde ich so großartig. Und da möchte ich mich also im Namen aller hier bedanken. Das ist ein Highlight. So. Tausend Dank für die vielen lieben Worte. Jetzt habe ich ein bisschen rote Ohren bekommen. Aber ich bin gern gekommen. Ich war ja bei der AAC schon ganz am Anfang. Ne? Sie wissen das besser, Herr Götze. Ja, 2008, ich vergesse immer die Zahlen. so, Obwohl ich andere Zahlen zum Erschrecken vieler Leute immer nie vergesse. Ne? Aber so Daten und sowas, ja. Aber ich bin, das war für mich selbstverständlich, als Sie angerufen haben, Herr Götze, dass ich dann Ja sage und meinen Kalender irgendwie freiräume. Auch als Neuwiener, Sie sehen es an meiner Kleidung, ich bin jetzt von Stuttgart nach Wien umgezogen und genieße die K und K überbleibsel dieser wunderbaren Stadt, bin aber schon noch in Stuttgart. Jetzt wollte ich ja eigentlich, habe ich ein bisschen revoltiert, weil ich den Vortrag nicht auf Englisch halten wollte. Das hat nämlich einen ganz einfachen Grund. So please apologize for speaking German. A couple of few words for those which do not understand German. How many are they? 
Okay, we speak English tonight for five or six. Okay, this is a question of politeness. Aber es hat ja auch was mit diesem kulturellen Lücke indirekt auch zu tun. Wenn wir in der Wissenschaft, und ein Bein von mir ist eben in der Wissenschaft, nach neuen Erkenntnissen ringen und wir gewinnen diese Erkenntnisse und wir benennen die Phänomene, die wir entdeckt haben oder die Tatsachen, die wir entdeckt haben, sofort, und das macht man ja heute, mit einem englischsprachigen Ausdruck oder einer englischen Abkürzung, sei sie noch so albern, und dann muss ja der deutsche Professor auch alles auf Englisch publizieren, weil sonst kriegt er keine Forschungsgelder, das wird ja alles gecheckt. Dann geben Sie alles, was Sie Ihrem kulturellen Wissen hinzuaddieren in einen anderen Sprachraum. Ja, und Sie können ja heute, auch wenn Sie Latein gelernt haben, so wie ich, neun Jahre lang und das Latein verehren, als gute Basis für Schachspielen, können Sie mit Latein ja nicht mehr einkaufen gehen, ne? weil für all diese Dinge hier gibt es eben kein Wort, weil man das Lateinische nicht weiterentwickelt hat. Und wir sind im Deutschen als bald so weit, dass es auch, das dauert keine Generation mehr, sie viele Dinge gar nicht mehr in Deutsch ausdrücken können. Und dann kommt etwas, was Speaking of Brzezinski, der außenpolitische Berater seit Jimmy Carter und heimliche Außenpolitikmacher der Vereinten Nickten Staaten immer gesagt hat, nehme ihnen ihre Sprache und dann nimmst du ihnen ihre Geschichte. Und deshalb lege ich extrem viel Wert darauf, dass alles, was ich publiziere, was ich sage, dass ich das auf Deutsch und notgedrungenerweise auch in anderen Sprachen tue. Aber wir müssen sehr darauf achten, dass wir dieses Addendum dessen, was wir an Wissen gewinnen, dass wir das in unsere Sprache einbauen. So, as a question of politeness, I changed all my slides tonight, this afternoon, into English. I'm going to start, and I already struggled with the title, because there is no English word for Heimat. There is no French word for Bauculture, because la culture du bâtiment, this is not what it really means. So you cannot express what you intend to say if you speak in French, what I would love to do, because there is no word for it. And Heimat, there is no word for it, is much more than homeland. Heimat is the spiritual basis, it is all the tradition and all the history you are having in your backpack. This is Heimat. And the famous philosopher Ernst Bloch, he said, Architektur is the Produktionsversuch menschlicher Heimat. Architecture is a try to designed to erect, to create Heimat for the human beings. This is our responsibility. So, what does it mean to build Heimat for everyone? In order to also touch these future aspects, the main reason I have been invited for, I subdivided my lecture into a couple of chapters, to make it easy to be understood. And the first five or six chapters, this is a very rational description on where we are and what the boundary conditions for a future are. So talking about architecture, creating Heimat means talking about future, because as Volkwin Mark said, if you are an architect, you have to think today about the hospital, which is going to be opened in 20 years. Or if you come from Stuttgart, where we have a main station under construction since 25 or 30 years, you had to know in 1995 what is the right Main station designed for Stuttgart in the year 2025 when it's going to be opened. The Berlin people know what I'm talking about. So this is the situation. So architecture is anticipation by itself. And anticipation means to think about the future. And future thinking in a professional, in a scientific way, not in this blah blah and whatever, in a scientific way means to know where we are and what possible boundary conditions for a design of the futures do exist or do not exist. It means it is about finding out the boundaries in between which we can make decisions or where there is no chance to make a decision because we are already over the boundary. And touching these boundary conditions is relatively difficult. But uh, there is a need to do so, especially nowadays, where we are confronted with a multidisciplinary 
problem called global warming, which very much touches also the architecture of tomorrow. So I'm starting with a couple of chapters with a very dry, very scientific, very simple description of where are we. So we talk about population and population growth. You all know the numbers or you do, don't know them, the red one is the increase of population. We probably, we probably will touch the 10 billion, 10 milliarden, now this is the first problem of using different languages. Eh? Yeah, quite often you find translation errors which are really horrible. So whenever I talk about milliarden in the sense of E high nine, I say milliarden, yeah? Or E high nine, as I say here, yeah? So this is milliarden, 10 milliarden or 10 billions in the other language. So we probably will touch this point and then the increase of the population will stop and population size will decrease, definitely, especially if you look on the number of the growth. This is not the fertility rate. The fertility is kids per woman and women live. And if you have a population which is a stable body, you need 2.1 kids per woman in order to keep the size of the population. Here we have a population growth, which means this also includes the people getting older and finally die, which is not included in the fertility rate, of course. And you see that you continuously decrease since years the population growth. So on the worldwide level, we definitely are going to become less people definitely, in the future. There is a peak to be expected, and we, our research predicts that peak in 2050, roughly, not taking into account hunger epidemics. This is something we are... Ah, by the way, hunger to have this old thing with the communication with the auditorium. Why do we talk about 1.5 degree? and not about 3.4. Hmm? This has something to do with the tipping point, right? Yeah. But not only. The main reason, and nobody has read the Paris Treaty Agreement because it's difficult to read and so on, but it's available in the internet. If you read the Treaty Agreement, the introduction of the number 1.5 is based on food security. It has nothing to do with the Dutchman getting wet feet or Hamburg being flooded by whatever ice cold water coming from the Antarctica. It has to do with food security. We will touch that point later on. So this is the situation between increase, just remember 10 billion, 10 milliarden in 2050, and a rapid decrease in the population growth. Now, we look at the population growth rates and how it is distributed over the world, and there's a clear concentration on what I call a band around the equator, a latitudinal limited band, or we could also call it a zone, and this is what I call the 30-30 degree, 30 plus, 30 minus, north and south degree zone. This is this band. And within this band, you have the main increase in the world's population in the next 30 years. Africa, of course, is well known to everyone, but also note that, for example, in the United States and Canada, and so we have an increase, as well as in Mongolia, we have a stop or a slight decrease in Russia and other countries. But it's important to remember this 30 plus 30 minus degree zone. We will touch that later on a couple of times. And now we look at the people in the population per nation, not per square meter, in millions. And we realize if we introduce the second zone, which is the 2040 degree zone, that most of the human beings in the world live in this very small band, which is from the southern boundary to the northern boundary, exactly 20 degrees latitude, which is just 2,200 kilometers, which is a very small distance. 2,200 kilometers is from here to Sicily or to Rome. 
Next one. The global warming food security, as I mentioned, and the migrations caused by climate change. Okay, what is global warming? Something a regular person does not feel. Some people even do not know what the actual level is. The ones who are interested in the numbers, they know it is 1.3 degrees. What does this mean, this one single number, 1.3? It is not the temperature increase in Hamburg or in Stuttgart. It is the over 30, 100, 365 days and over the entire surface of our Earth, the average increase. So this is a number which is not really useful because what do you want to do with that? It has nothing to do with a certain location in Africa. It has nothing to do with time or seasons or whatever. It is the average of the average of the average, but it's an important indicator. But we need to know, and we know that since 1977 precisely, since the scientific work of James F. Black, who tried to publish this, he was an employee of ExxonMobil, and then his bosses told him that he has to be quiet, he took the report and put it into the safe for 20 years. We could have known about the problems today very, very precisely by the scientific work of James F. Black, who died in the meantime. But what did he say? He found out, without using supercomputers, that this 1.3 degree to be expected in 2025, in his predictions, now we have 2022, this means he was very precise, is inhomogeneously distributed over the globe. It is 0.1, different, on the oceans, there we have an increase of 0.6 degrees only, and over the terrestrial surfaces we have two. Over all the terrestrial surfaces, over the year. If we ask, for example, about regional effects or seasonal effects, if you say, okay, where is the summer average temperature in these three months which define the summertime? the highest one compared to the pre-industrial times, then we find out it is the northeast of Siberia, which is causing a catastrophe, by the way. But what you need to know is that this is the real distribution, the annual one, over the year, from January to December over the world. But it clearly indicates that the temperature is decreasing over the Pacific Ocean. And it is dramatically increasing over Europe and North America. So there's much more action going on in the north than in the south. Because in the north we have more terrestrial surface, which warms up faster and keeps the energy longer than the oceans. If we say, now this is the, the Siberia effect, slightly indicated, and here we talk about an increase in the annual average in four degree plus. Now, if we say on what is happening in June, then it looks much more dramatical. And then we already see that, for example, the Mediterranean area, Spain, entire Italy, the Adriatic area, and the northern part of Africa is between four and six average increase over the month. This is important to know. And if you now go into single weeks and you go, for example, to Siberia, then you find out there is an increase of up to 20 degrees. Before the war, we had construction sites in Novosibirsk and so on. And the client said, you can come in wintertime, it's not that cold anymore. The rivers do not freeze. What does this mean? It means that we now project again the 20 to 40 degree zone, and we now look at the population distribution within or on the surface of the globe, then we realize this is the latitude, minus is the south, this is the north, that between 20 and 40, about 4.6 to 4.8 billions, milliarden people are living which falls together with this overheated zone. 
means we in the 20 to 40 degree zone, beginning in China, the north parts of India, the entire Mediterranean Sea and fully hitting the United States are facing a fact that we have dramatic increase in average temperature as well as in peak temperatures. Two to six degrees. Now what does this mean? <clears throat> On the one hand side, if the air is getting warmer, there's an interesting scientific effect that the relative humidity in the air of the atmosphere stays constant. That means if the air is warming up, it sucks the humidity out of the ground. You have drought caused by the warming of the air. Not only because it does not rain or whatever, it's just because the air is too dry. And if you have exposed surfaces, means no grassland and forest, for example, but agricultural land after the harvesting, then the dry, warm air sucks out all the humidity and you don't get it in anymore that fast as you need it. Which is causing then water stress. Water stress means not drought in whatever millimeters per square meter and so on. It means less water than the years before. Yeah, so this is the water stress distribution. There are several ways to measure that. This does not interest us at it in any way, but there is no water stress in Central Africa because it never rained there in the last century. So people have no stress. It does not rain this year or next year. But in the other countries, they have a real stress if it does not rain anymore compared to the time before. And this measure, what was before and what is today and what is going to be in the future, this is called water stress. Now, water stress falls together with the 20 to 40 degree zone where most of the people are living. What has this to do with harvest, with crop yield? <clears throat> okay, you realize in the meantime, I'm very deep in agricultural science also. And this is very interesting. If you ask what is the ideal temperature to grow, for example, mice or soya beans, then it is something, this is the crop yield, means the amount of fruits you harvest. And if the temperature is not higher than a certain critical temperature, which for both of them is 25 to 29 degree roughly, you have the highest crop yield. Means for the farmer, this is the optimum, always 29 degree, that's it. Now the interesting thing is if the average daytime temperature of one day only exceeds that level and is, for example, 35, which means it is during daytime 45 and at nighttime 25, which is really something, but it happens more and more. If you have these 35 daytime average temperature increase, then you have a decrease of 8 to 10% of crop yield or of the harvest for one day only. And if you have a certain period of time where you have these hot days, then the leaves on the lower side of the leaf, they close all these what we call Spaltöffnungen and they do not breathe anymore because the plant is anxious to dry out. But if it closes these Spaltöffnungen, then it does not breathe, means it does not have an intake of C, CO2, and then changes that into carbon, has no growth and therefore it has no fruits. Hmm. Easy to be understood. Now, we look at the predicted losses in crop yield for the six largest producer of mice, as an example. In the case that we reach two degree average all over the planet, which is predicted in 2040, something like this. If we do not dramatically change the way of our life. The six largest producers lose in million on tons per year. Now we look at the market leader, which is the United States. They lose 40, 50 plus million of tons 
China 25, then the two South America countries, they lose 15, 18 each. If we sum that up, then we lose 120 million tons of mice, which is 10% of what we harvested in the years before, which is 10% in 2040, 2050, roughly, what we lose. But at the same time, the population increases from 10 milliard, from 8 milliard and today to 10, which is 25%. So we have an increase of 25% people, and we have a decrease of 10% minimum of the harvest. So you do not have to be a scientist to predict that this is causing hunger epidemics like hell, which will cause wars and whatever, and migration. If we talk about migration, it comes to architecture, because everyone who migrates and leaves home arrives at another point and asks for a high mat, which has to be built then. Okay. Again, this is all in this zone where most people in the world are living. So this is a boundary. If we do not stop global warming, if we achieve two degrees with this inhomogeneous distribution, we have to face the fact that we have a decrease in crop yield, in crop harvesting of 10 to 20 percent, which comes parallel to the increase of the population. That means we have to talk about what are we going to do with this. Next, the estimates of the future consumption of the building material. Okay, nowadays there are many people stating if we have this global warming problem, the best is we stop building. It would be quite unfair to the people in the so-called third world. Whereas the term third world is something I typically do not like to use because it includes a ranking means we are the first and the other ones are the third, which is not okay. Now this has been replaced due to this political correctness thing to global south and global north, which is even more stupid. Which is even more stupid. This, it is as stupid as the word renewable energy. Yeah, there is no renewable energy. Einstein's famous formula is E is equivalent to the mass times the speed of light to the square. There is no zero in this formula. But scientists talk about renewable energy or about decarbonization. Even our chancellor, she called, talked always about decarbonization and she had a scientific education. I said, please, not me. The most important parts of mine are carbon. I do not want to be decarbonized. Make it simple so that everyone understands that decarbonization is nothing else than decreasing the emission of CO2. Everyone understands that. Nobody understands decarbonization. At least nobody without an academic education. So if we talk about the future consumption now of building material in our world, we have to differentiate three different chapters, let me call it. The one I call that the Nachholbedarf, is a German word lacking the right English expression means, I want to have in the future what the others already have. Me living in Africa, having no school, no access to health system, no access to whatever, I want to have access to a school, to a university, to a doctor's practice, to a hospital, to a university clinic. But having access to this means you have to build that. And you have to build the building as well as all the infrastructure, the feeding with fresh water, taking away the wastewater, the streets, and whatever is needed. So this is building material. And if we really make it serious, take it serious, our Sunday morning speeches, where we say, okay, the population increase, the best to do is bring education and bring welfare to the people in the third world, bring them hospitals and education, especially to the women, that means build something for them. So the question is, how much do we have to build? 
a capitalist would say, how big is the market? The next one is, how much do we need to build if we have to face the population increase by two milliarden? What does this mean? And the third one is, if people start to migrate because they migrate out of 20 to 40 degrees zone, how many people are going to walk out? Today we already say and kid about, we say, okay, now we grow white wine in mecklenburg vorpommern which is a relatively tough area northeast of Germany. So now we grow wine there, and everyone smiles at great wine in Mecklenburg. We, ah, I even know someone who grows wine in South Sweden. Yeah, this is true. And if you have friends in the Bourgogne in France, they tell you that they harvest less wine because it is not raining anymore. So means the agricultural land is moving northwards, but this also needs the people to take care of that land and to harvest what's growing there. means you have a huge migration out of the 20 to 40 degree zone to the northern zones, and those people will ask for Heimat. So what does this mean? Three scenarios. Let's start with the scenario number one, Nachholbedarf. If we want to talk about this, we have to know how much building material do we own. Question for every young architect. A German citizen owns per capita roughly 450 tons. Plus minus. Nobody really knows the dead weight of the Dome of Cologne and nobody really knows the dead weight of all these harbor installments out there. These are rough estimates, plus minus 10%. But if we have the 10 to X, you have this, if X plus minus one, if when we the, 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 the dimension have, then we are already relatively good. So we have actually 8 million people living on the planet, milliarden out of which the Erste Welt, the First World, is 1.4, and the Third World, including all the countries on the transition to the so-called industrial countries, is 6.6. .6. And how is building material distributed? Average? In the First World, 335. It's a number on the lower end of the range. So there is a relative high chance that this number is pre precise and not lower than this. It, the chance that it is bigger is quite high. But I'm using this number 335 in the future of my talk. Whereas the third world owns 75 tons. The difference is there is no ICE high-speed train in Africa. There is not that many university hospitals, universities and whatever. This access to healthy living and to education is not there. This relatively perfect infrastructure we have in our Western world is not there. And the difference is, easily we are counted, 260 tons. Which you would have to add to each one of those living in the third world to lift them up to a building standard which we have in the industrial countries. By the way, the increase in building material in Germany is still 12 to 15 tons per person a year, which is about 1 over 5, 1 over 6 of what the people in the third world are owning. Now we look at this diagram. What does it mean? The red curve is the population increase. We already know that. And now we have the year 2020, 22. And this is what had been already accumulated as building material. Here we stop the consideration. We say, OK, from now on, we talk about the add-on. And in the first world, there will be no add-on. We just stop to make our thoughts a little bit more easy to make it more easy to understand what's going to happen. And the first question was, how much material do we need for this so-called Nachholbedarf? So the light blue bands, the first world is 428, and the other one is 480, 450, means 1.4 milliarden 
own more or less the same amount of building material than the other rest of 6.6. If we now say, okay, those 6.6, they should have the same level as the industrial countries, then we have this. You know what that means? You have to add to the already built world with a dead weight of 880 tons, another 1,700 gigatons or milliarden tons or billion tons. Means you have to add just to satisfy the request of the already living people in the third world, the existing built environment two times more. This is one and one and one. Now we have to talk about the population increase. Same again. The total amount to be increased is 667. Now we have an total installment already of more than 3,000 gigatons, where we are nowadays at 870. And now there is this scenario, how many refugees are fleeing out of the 20 to 40 degree zone. However, this is a scenario which can be discussed forever. But if we have 4.8 people living in that band, and we face the fact that it's got getting goddamn hot in Sicily and Spain and southern part of France, the entire Adriatic area, as well as in the Turkish, Greek, Egyptian area, and the people move those 2,000 kilometers northwards, which is nothing. Then you have a movement of millions, hundreds and thousands of millions of people. And if we now assume that in the first wave, we have about 1.5 billion people moving, then we have an add-on and an add-on and an add-on, and everyone realizes this is absolutely impossible to be done. Absolutely impossible. We don't have the building material. We do not have the energy to produce that material. And the emissions caused by the extraction of that material out of the ground by burning the cement and the, the bricks and whatever would be so high that we would have an average raise in temperature of 6 or 8 or even more degrees. Average not 1.3. So we have to realize, being city planners, architects and engineers, to continue as we did it in the last years is absolutely a self-killing procedure. And not in 100 years, it is in 20 years, max. So we have to find other ways to build. We cannot say, okay, now we have a relatively high standard of living, we stop building and the people in Africa do not interest me. If they do not interest us, we will face a social destabilization in those countries. This goes up to China and everywhere. And this destabilization means political radicalism and whatever comes with it. And the global society will not survive that, definitely not. There are people in the world, think tanks in the States and whatever, they say, okay, more or less secretly, let them die by hunger. With our media technology, we make it. 1,000 million people dying within 10 years by hunger, we make that. We make the rest of the people believe that this is nothing which touches them. But nobody talks about the fact, what do you need to have a society like the our ones surviving on the technological level we have. So first thing is a cell phone. Huh? How many people do you need if the rest of the world's population is only 200 million, or let's say all the US people, 400 million? How many people do you need to enable this rest of the world to have a cell phone? You need someone who gets out the nickel and the copper and the lithium and the iridium in South Chile out of the ground, or in Siberia or in China. You have to have a university with a professor of electronics who educates the students on how to design the chips. You have to have someone who is designing the chip factory. You have to have someone who runs the chip factory. 
You have to have someone who produces the batteries, etc., etc. Means you need minimum, minimum two, three hundred thousand people to continue with the production of cell phones. Then you need a satellite system all around the world so that you have contact with the other people at the other corner of the world. So how many people do you need to run a satellite system, to design the satellites, to shoot them up into the atmosphere, to manage all the data flow? This is not 10 and this is not 10,000. You need hundreds of thousands of people capable to do that. And this is only the cell phone. Now you want to watch YouTube. You want to have food. So you need hundreds of millions of people to keep the functionality of this leftover society. But they have to work really hard. And this is the minimum condition. So the idea to have the rest of the world dying and we survive as the preferred people, God's own country and whatever and so on, this is an absolute misunderstanding of the interrelation between the facts. I do not know the number how many people we no need, but one thing is clear, it is much, much more than one billion, much more. So now the question is the availability of the building materials. Let's assume that we do not increase the amount of material to four gigatons and whatever, but that we have a slight increase, something modest, which gives the human beings in the other countries of the so-called third world a life in dignity. Availability of building materials means we have to talk about peak scenarios. Is the material out there? There was a little bit of thing with the peak scenario of peak oil. Yeah? This was caused by the first report of the Club of Rome, where around this report, prediction said, okay, there's a famous man called Hubbard in the oil business, and he predicted that oil is running out in the 70s of the last centuries. It has its peak. And from then on, production decreases and prices are going up. And they projected... Hubbard's scientific work to the world and the result was it did not fit. And then everyone said, forget about this Hubbard thing and the peak oil story. This is not correct to Hubbard because Hubbard was talking about the situation in the United States and he precisely met the point. Hubbard was totally right. But the other people taking the methodology of Hubbard and based that on a relatively poor databases they were wrong, okay, for 40 years, because the research nowadays clearly predicts that we have a peak oil in the next 20 to 40 years. And then the amount of material you can get off the ground decreases. There's still a lot of material there, but it decreases and the prices go up. Remember that when we talk about corn in the Ukraine in Odessa. Hmm? So there was corn in Odessa and it could not be shipped out. And then the international media and the politicians said Putin is whatever and hundreds of millions of people will die especially in the eastern part of Africa because they have no corn to eat. This was the statement. So I asked myself how much corn is in the world? What are we talking about? We talk about 30 million tons in Odessa to be exported. The world production is 3 milliarden tons. Means if we take the entire harvest and if we distribute it capita per capita per capita, over 365 years, each of us is getting one kilogram of corn per day. And the material in Odessa Harbor is half a spoonful compared to the kilogram. So this does not even matter if the material stays in Odessa or not, but the price doubled. So a friend of mine is in that business, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, we are making money. We are making money like hell. 
And then I met him a couple of weeks later and I said, I learned in the newspapers that most of the material from Odessa goes directly to Germany for feeding pigs. And he said, this is okay. But I said, and what is about the Eastern African people? He said, yeah, the price is falling now again and now they can buy the corn on the world market. So it was not about transferring the wheat from Odessa to Somalia, it was about enabling Somalia to buy wheat on the world market. This was not a gift. This was setting the business in state again. And the same happens with all these declining curves. So this can be predicted. But let's make the life a little bit more difficult or simple. We say, okay, how long do certain materials last? For example, what is a lot of interest is copper. Because we need copper, for example, for electricity lines, which are the basis for the changing of our energy system. Without copper, there is no change in the energy system. So we have range scenarios. How long does it last? There is two different range scenarios to be distinguished. The one is the static range, where you say, okay, we take the resources and we divide that through the actual consumption. So the consumption is assumed to be constant in the next years. A resource is not the amount of material which exists. It is the amount of material which can be got of, out of the soil and out of the ground with technologically sense-making methods for an economically sense-making level of money. This is defined as a resource. Everything else is exploding prices. So. But if you take for copper, for example, now we have the, and the dynamic ranges, we divide the resources through the future demand. So the consumption C is not constant. It increases with the number of people consuming copper or with the society changing its energy system from combustion of oil and whatever to electricity, as we do, and many others hopefully do too. But the surprise is the static range of copper is 43 years and the dynamic range is 23. So if you are a capitalist, buy a copper mine, the best business you can ever make. It is much more difficult to predict that for wood and whatever and whatever, but this is just an example to, to give you the information that you have to differentiate between static range and dynamic range. And to make it very clear that the important dynamic range for important materials is relatively short. Part three, I have to accelerate. As soon as someone falls asleep, I stop, so just indicate by closing the eyes. The energy problem, the surprising thing is we have no energy problem. Because the sun shines alone, the sun alone shines 10,000 times more energy onto the globe than the human beings need for all their activities. So we are flooded with energy. Why do we talk about energy problems? Okay, this is a misleading of the population. What we have is an energy supply problem. This is something totally different. There's enough energy, but the energy supply does not work. Why? Okay, there is an external effect. Often enough, the energy supply is part of hidden economic wars. You are getting the oil, you don't get the oil. Yeah, we ex bomb your power plants, we bomb your gas pipelines, whatever. This is nothing else than terrorism or economic war. And then there's an internal effect, of course, often caused by non-functioning supply system or governmental incapabilities. When the German government 10 years ago found out that the turn of the energy supply system from the combustion of gas and oil and coal into photovoltaics and winds will take place, they needed 12,000 kilometer high voltage power lines. So there was a law, the erste Ausbaurichtlinie should finish the 12,000 kilometer last year in 2022. Then the Bundesrechnungshof found out last year when they should have achieved the goal 
instead of 12,000, there were 2,000. 1 over 6. So now they published, within a week or so, a new program. Eh? We will achieve the 12,000 kilometers in another 10 years. But in another 10 years, this is 2032. This is what I mean with internal effects, so it's very polite, but if we stream that, I have to be polite. I do not talk about the energy transition in detail and so on. This is much too complicated, but just to make you knowing, we have not an energy problem, we have an energy supply problem, which is governed by external as well as by internal effects, which can be overcome, especially the internal effects. Now we talk about emissions. Okay, we all know that we have to reduce our emissions. By what? So 2022, this is the bright blue curve. It ends at 42.43 gigatons CO2 equivalents. So the question is, what is this number composed of? So the first answer will be, this is anthropogen. So what is anthropogen? Caused by human beings, driving cars and warming water. Is growing pigs and cows included? Is production of fertilizers included? No. Because some clever politician, politicians or lobby people made it clear that agriculture and cattle and pigs and whatever you eat and chicken is not an anthropogene emission. The emission comes from the cow and not from the human being. Huh? And feeding the cow is something different, so we do not add that up. If you take all the agricultural and food production emissions on top of this, then we end at 60, roughly. So now people are talking about percentages. Eh? We gained 1%, we got whatever. Cement production is 7%. Yeah, 7% of what? Of 45 or of 60? Or is there another trick behind? So never believe percentage values. Never. A percentage of what? And nobody knows what is what. But one thing is clear. We have scientifically based today the situation that we have a working point and we know that the temperature increase in the future is directly linked to the CO2 content in the atmosphere. So we know how much can we emit and what causes then what temperature increase. And then temperature increase from 1.3 to 1.5 and the world's average means 290 gigatons, 290 milliarden tonnen CO2. So you can imagine one ton of CO2 is, if you place it in the atmosphere, a cube of 8 by 8 by 8 meters. This is one ton of CO2. So we have the allowance to emit 290 gigatons, and then we are still in the 1.5 degree. But who knows how much are the human beings emitting per second all over the world? 1,300 tons. Means if you divide the 290 gigatons by 1,300 per second, you end with seven years. In seven years, the story is over. So this means that diagram. The red line, the dotted one, means continue as we did as we do, but keep the 290 gigatons. And that means we have to stop emitting in 2030 down to zero. And the surface between that curve, this is the 290 gigatons. Now you can say, okay, give me a little bit more time and this rough decrease and so whatever, blah, blah, blah. So you can come up with that, a linear decrease. This triangle's area is the same as the one we omitted above there. So the surface here, the integral below the curve is 290. And it ends then, surprisingly, in 2036. 
which is just in 14 years. So what I mean is any indication and any announcement of the point when we are net zero, might it be whatever, in 2050 and 2045 and so on, ends up with a curve, you can draw any curve. But the integral below the curve must be smaller than 290 gigatons. So this is the world we are living in. And it's quite obvious there is no chance in this world to achieve 1.5. No way. We can talk about it, but in our bag we should know that we should be happy if we could achieve 2 or 2 plus. So, now the greenhouse gases caused by the built environment is the responsibility we are standing for. First thing I have to state, the numbers published are very often not right. This is a big, big problem. So for example, years ago, the International Energy Agency published 38 degrees, a percent. Not of what, yeah? So they built the Gebäude, this is the, in the German texts, it was Gebäude, stehen für 38 percent buildings. What was meant is residential and not residential buildings. But in Germany, buildings is also bridges and tunnels. So this is in the translation already a mistake of 10 to 15 percent. If the translator is not qualified enough and he translates buildings to Bauwerke, the German architect and engineer interpret this as Bauwerke is infrastructure plus the buildings, which is wrong. Then the next thing is, in the 38%, the erection emissions during production and the erection of the building were only in parts considered. Other ones like transport cost emissions were left off. There was no recycling and no deposition emissions included, etc. So we are lacking a lot of emissions. And if you take care and you add that all up and you use the 45 gigatons of the so-called anthropogene emissions, then you find out a generalized corridor within that is the truth. For the production and the use of the buildings is between 38 and 44. For the demolition, deposition and recycling is another 4.8. For the buildings above ground and for the infrastructure is this minimum 12%, minimum. Means if we add that all up, don't look at those numbers. Then you end at 52 or something around 53. Means the building industry beginning at the extraction of the material out of the ground, the production of building parts and building materials, the erection of the building, running the building, decomposing the building, depositing or recycling is 50%. It's half of the game. So there's a huge lever arm we have in hands to change that by changing the technologies we built. Okay, one hour twenty, it's okay. Be careful, I can talk quite long. <laughs> At Stuttgart University, when I was a young freshman student in the first semester, we had Buckminster Fuller, and he started his lecture at five o'clock in the afternoon and he talked for eight hours. <laughs> so since I start at seven, it will be quite late. But we are already at part five. Part five means an aging society. What does this mean? Now this is really top secret because this is a part of my new book and I want to ask whether we can stop the streaming for the next slides, yeah? Aging societies, what does this mean? So this is living in the transparency, emission-free, consuming no energy from the public grid since 22 years. 
Let's talk a little bit about the material we have been using and we are using since then. If we talk about a reduction of building materials, we have a differentiate in two different groups. The one is the primary material, the other one is the secondary material. Okay, primary is this one which you use for the very first time, and the secondary is obviously the recycled one. There is in English terms the thing reuse and recycle, which means in the German translation, wieder verwenden oder verwerten. What is the difference between the two of them? Verwenden means you do not change the geometry and the materiality. You take the piece one to one. You have the beam in the living, in the residential building, and you make out of with the same beam a roof in a whatever. Pig's home. Verwerten means destroying the geometry and the cohesion of the material means the brick is getting to dust, the concrete is getting to aggregates, and then we reform concrete. But this is energy consuming, eh? because you change the material, you recompose the material, you change the geometry, whereas here you take it one to one. And there is, and I think this is a very nice thing, if you use it for the same applications, then we talk about wiederverwenden. A residential stays to be a residential building element. Whereas if there is a downgrading in the use, then we talk about weiterverwenden. So terminology is when we talk about Liechtenstein. Yeah? If you don't have a word for something, you can think about it. There is the non-verbal thinking, of course, but not applicable if we talk about things like this. So from then on, we said, okay, now we are capable in the year 2000 to build a house, which is 95% recyclable and so on, without a chimney, which feeds itself. And then we said, okay, now we do an experimental building, which produces double the energy it uses without a chimney and is recyclable. And it's the first house in the world which communicates, which talks to its neighbor in order to exchange energy consumption and energy production. The neighbor is a house built by Le Corbusier in Stuttgart, which needs energy like hell. We have an overproduction, so we transfer the energy to the Le Corbusier building as well as to feed the car. And since architecture always has to be fun, this is an electric car, and you might drive into the living room with the electric car. And if you are anxious to drive backwards with all this Chinese glass here, we have a rotating table which automatically rotates the car so you drive in forward and you drive out forward. Which made all the people wanted to use that turning table, everyone, especially the kids. So production time one day. And then we decided to let's say, to create and to develop the technology to a real industrial-based type of building, which allows for all the varieties you might have. So the technology is not a same building part. Every part is the same on every house. So there's a house Erika from the producer number one, and every house Erika is a house Erika. There's a house Alpenblick by the other producer, and you really know this is Alpenblick by the producer XYZ. So we want to say the client, based on CNC technologies, might have whatever he wants. 25 different types of facades, the windows there or there or there. The only thing which is standardized is the production technology itself and the way we join the elements. So if there is a nailing, there is a nailing for every building. If there is a screwing, there is a screwing with the same type of screw. But the rest is open. So we designed this refugee home with a relatively high degree of recyclability, completely furnished inside. So the module came around the corner, and one hour later, you could take a shower in this module, prefabricated and pre-tested. But we were not really satisfied with the type of material, because most of that material was fresh material, means primary material. So we took part in the biggest research program in the, in the building sector of Switzerland had been invited to contribute one pavilion out of 12. 
So this is the one I designed. I'm the only German architect, all the rest is Swiss. Switzerland is very protective, as other countries too. But I love to work there. And it was totally open. So he was building this contribution to research the degradation of water temperature in Swiss hotels. What I did not know is that a Finnish sauna has higher water temperatures than a Swedish sauna, has obviously higher water temperatures than a jacuzzi, and higher water temperatures than the water you need to wash your hands. So now they boil the water for every different sauna, and he said we can save a lot of energy if we cascade the water. So this is the reason for this. And they asked me, what are you intending to do? So and I said, I want to build a house which is mostly out of secondary material. And then they said, OK, it's a great idea. So we did so. This is from inside. There are two doctoral students living in it. They would live there for free. And on the other side, they have to welcome people twice a week, which they're now guided so. So they have to clean their apartment twice a week, at least. So there is radical things. This is all concrete. This is formerly a brick wall. This is aluminum. It is recycled aluminum. Aluminum is not toxic. If you do it the right way, you can recycle aluminum 10, 12 times without any degradation of the quality. So we did so. We have the lighting elements. There is no electric wiring in the ceiling. These have, uh, wie mit Sackmeister, nicht Batterien, sondern Akkus. Yeah. And if the Akku is going to be empty, the thing peeps. And then you take it away, it is held magnetically there. And you bring it on a place here where it is held magnetically and then loads again the Akku. So zero meters of electric cable. And of course a lot of fun because you can place them everywhere you want depending on what you intend to do. So, as I said, it must be always a little bit of fun with it. So this is a, an, a collection of the materials I have been using. This, for example, is um, textiles. This is jeans. Jeans textiles. Yeah. Bleu de Gêne jeans. You know the, the story about Bleu de Gêne? Okay. And this is, okay, the building stands in Dübendorf, close to Zürich. This in the meantime is called Dübendorf marble. It's made of PET bottles. So this is, for example, the wood. This is the jeans material which we used for insulation. We then have this in a multi-layer arrangement which we, where we clipped it or where we nailed it. There is no gluing. Nothing which cannot be decomposed. It's all composition, decomposition. This is, of course, tetrapack, one of the most toxic things. But at least it has one recycle cycle. This is glass sharks. If you recycle glass, for example, from a recycling, glass recycling container, you typically have to melt the glass up to 1,400 degrees to have it really liquid and clean. And this needs, of course, a lot of energy. There's a technology to make it honey liquid type with only 600 degrees. And this is the technology we applied here. So you see the sharks still, which gives a very nice pattern because the light transmittance is very inhomogeneous, but it's absolutely water and airtight. And this is Dübendorf Marmor. So this is PET bottles. The only secret behind is you have to select them in a way that you have the transparent bottle and the blue closure. You can have that with red closures or yellow ones, but we took this one. And this is the cladding for all the bathrooms, toilets, etc. Because it's very hygienic. It's very, very clean, easy to be cleaned, watertight, and so on. So from then on, we did this is all container buildings, all modular. The newest one is this one, which is 400 apartments for nurses and doctors close to a big clinic in Stuttgart, which is the first multi-story and whatever building in Germany, which is plus energy and zero emission 
and more or less fully recyclable, 80%, 90%, something like this. So this is what we are doing, and you see it is possible, it is not that difficult, we just have to start doing it. And at the end, it always has to look good. If the people don't love the buildings they are living in, then it is not sustainable at all. So after one hour, 42 minutes, I would love to stop now. And thank you very much for your attendance and the fact that nobody fell asleep give me a little bit of encouragement. Thank you. Jetzt eine eschatologische Botschaft geworden. Wenn ich frei nach Hölderlin dacht, wo die Gefahr, Gefahr am größten ist, da kommt das Rettende auch. Man muss allerdings schon ein pathologischer Optimist sein bei dieser wunderbaren Gattung Menschheit, das zu glauben. Also bleibt es nur übrig, es zu hoffen. Und, äh, und, ja. Also ich hatte einen langjährigen, sehr, sehr engen Freund, der hieß Helmut Jan und lebte in Chicago. Und der ging als frisch diplomierter Mann, nachdem er bei von Seidlein sich nicht richtig zu Hause fühlte, ins IIT. Und arbeitete nebenher in einem Büro namens Charles F. Murphy. Und in Chicago haben ja die Iren ziemlich was zu sagen. Ne? Die Iren am meisten, dann die Polen, dann die Schweden und dann kommen die Deutschen. Also die Bürgermeister sind meistens irisch und die most important people are Irish. Und dann gibt es dort, gab es die größte Ausstellungshalle der Welt, McCormick Place, ja, 1970 oder so. Und an einem Freitagnachmittag bekommt also Charles F. Murphy einen Anruf vom Bürgermeister. Und er lautete, weil der Helmut stand daneben und hat es mitgekriegt. Listen, McCormick is burning. Hat also Feuer gefangen, ist total abgebrannt. Start drawing. <lacht> also. Meine Message, the world is burning. Jetzt einfach start rescue, start drawing. Gut, also das gilt jetzt für unsere Profession. Gott sei Dank gibt es nicht nur unsere Profession, sondern es gibt ja nicht nur die, die sagen, wie kann man den Verbrauch runterbringen oder wie kann man es so machen, dass es sich selbst trägt, sondern es gibt natürlich auch noch die Profession, die Grundlagen forscht. Und da liegt eigentlich meine größte Hoffnung, die dann sagt, und das, was schon beim Tipping Point ist oder schon drüber geht, kann man sogar wegkriegen. Denn insofern, wenn man ein ultraorthodoxer äh, Zukunftsgläubiger und Technologiegläubiger Optimist ist, dann war das bisher noch immer so, und das macht ja die gesamte menschliche Kultivierung aus, dass ständig das Wissen sich erweitert hat. Und genau immer das kultiviert hat, was man zum Überleben brauchte. Nur jetzt ist der Druck ganz groß. Und das betrifft natürlich dann auch, was ich heute gesagt habe, zum Beispiel diesen Versuch, nicht nur irgendwo CO2 rauszukriegen und mit viel Geld irgendwo zu bunkern, sondern es die Natur selber machen zu lassen. Das wäre irre. Aber das bedeutet nur, leider muss man alles parallel machen. Alles. Wir haben es neben dem gesamtgesellschaftlichen Problem, dass uns die Situation nicht bewusst ist, dass wir sie verdrängen, bei dem Bewusstseinsfaktor das Problem, dass es ein hochgradig interdisziplinäres Problem ist. Und wie ich ja versucht habe, ein bisschen rüberzubringen, man hat eine inhomogene Wärmeverteilung, damit hat man eine inhomogene Trockenheitsverteilung, jetzt sind dummerweise die Haupt Crop Areas, die Getreideanpflanzungsbereiche, genau dort, wo man diese Trockenperioden hat. Also gibt es weniger zu essen, also migrieren die Leute, also brauchen die Leute Baustoffe. Damit emittiere ich wieder etwas. Und das muss man alles verstehen. Und das, das beinahe hätte ich jetzt gesagt, das Verfluchte. Das Elende an dem Ganzen ist, dass die Wissenschaft nicht in der Lage ist, das Ganze zu erklären. Also das Ideal von Platons Akademie, das Ganze zu verstehen, ist nicht Inhalt der heutigen Wissenschaft, sondern die versuchen, das Detail zu verstehen bis in eine unendliche Tiefe. 
Und Sie können mit Physikprofessoren reden und anderen, die sagen ja in meiner Fakultät, ich kann mit den Kollegen gar nicht mehr reden, ja über Fußball schon, aber über das, was sie machen, kann ich nicht mit ihnen reden. Ich bin Astrophysiker und der ist, was weiß ich, Teilchenphysiker und der macht dieses und der macht jenes. Und wir haben so unterschiedliche Sprachen und Denkwelten, wir können uns gerade noch auf der obersten Ebene unterhalten. Und das ist ja bei vielen so. Aber wenn wir lauter Superspezialisten haben und niemand haben, der all diese Dinge zusammen integriert zu einem Ganzen, dann kriegen wir das nicht hin. Ich nenne das das inverse babylonische Problem. Ne? Also ich bedanke mich jetzt bei dem interdisziplinären Generalisten per se. Und ich habe ja gesagt... <lacht> Sie wissen ja, ich liebte, liebe ihn auch, äh, Schleichner. Und er machte mal diesen schönen Spruch, äh, die Architekten können nicht konstruieren und die Ingenieure können nicht entwerfen. Das ist aber wirklich sektoral, sehr sektoral gedacht. Im Grunde genommen geht es eigentlich, was beide Eben, die sind geborene und berufene Generalisten und die sind auch alle nur noch Tunnelblicker, schlucken alle Prämissen, die ihnen gegeben werden und führen Prämissen eifertig durchaus und machen, fragen, stellen nie die Prämissen in Frage. Was sie heute gemacht haben, war ein Kursus in Denken lernen. Also vielen Dank. Danke. Danke, Marc.